you know, radio TV phono nut here and doing a little cleaning out. Uh, you might remember this power supply that we got in a while back that got dented and beat all to heck because it was packed poorly and the 6 and 12 volt range switch won't turn probably because it got a good whack and damaged the switch. And then when I opened it up, I was greeted with this where somebody did a very sloppy job of replacing the original rectifier with silicon diodes and some of the connections broke loose. Well, I got most of my money back on this thing. Everything but the shipping, which wasn't very much. They gave me the option that I could either keep the power supply and get everything back but the shipping or send the power supply back and on their dime and get all of my money back. I probably should have just sent the whole thing back to them and been done with it, but I decided to keep it because I might be able to bring it back to life or use it for parts but then I got to looking for a better power supply of this type and like everything else on eBay everybody seems to want ludicrous prices for them that's pretty much what eBay has turned into today just a place to advertise Chinese junk and overpriced older stuff because people think they're sitting on a gold mine just because it's got some age on it well, I did find a power supply that supposedly has been repaired, and I got it for a pretty good price. I paid more for shipping than what I paid for the power supply, but it looks like it's packed pretty good. We'll find out in just a minute. So yeah, here it is in this big box here, which is a good sign, and I'm not hearing anything rattling around, so we'll open it up and see what we got. All right, here's a photocopy of the uh, factory information on the power supply. And yeah, it looks like this one's probably packed better than the other one we got. So yeah, this guy went to more effort than most do. Now let's unwrap the bubble and see what we got. And this is what we have, a Heathkit battery eliminator, model IP12. I think it's probably a little bit newer than the other one. Uh, he repainted the case. Uh, a little den here on the side here, but I believe he mentioned that in, in the description. So that's, you know, that's no big deal anyway. So yeah, he repainted the case. He replaced the original rectifier stack with some shot key diodes and replaced one of the bad capacitors one of the filter capacitors was bad and he put a 250 ohm resistor across the output to bleed off the capacitor whenever the power supply was turned off and he did show pictures on the ebay listing showing what was done so i know what was done to it in my opinion any restore that's worth their salt won't mind showing pictures of the work they did it's the the shoddy ones that are trying to hide something that don't want to post pictures now this is a unregulated power supply that has an output of up to six volts six or twelve volts five amps continuous 7.5 amps maximum oh, that's on your uh filtered output and over here on the output that's not as well filtered we have 6 volt 10 amp continuous 15 amp maximum or 12 volt 5 amp continuous or 7.5 amps maximum and like I said this is completely unregulated you're the regulator by adjusting the voltage control now you might ask yourself in today's world why would you even want something like this when there's uh, plenty of regulated DC power supplies out there? Well, true, such, such power supplies are very common and can often be bought cheaply, especially on the used market. But a lot of these modern regulated power supplies don't have the current capacity needed for testing such things as old vibrator-based tube-type car radios 
and certain farm radios. It was made back in the 30s and 40s that ran off of a six volt storage battery and used a vibrator based power supply. So something like this comes in handy for that. And another advantage to these types of power supplies is they're pretty much blow up proof unless you do something really stupid and bypass the fuse and short the output leads together for an extended period of time. Whereas a modern solid state regulated power supply can get ticked off and you may end up uh, blowing up your components in the power supply if you end up accidentally shorting something out. So, so that's the reason something like this is preferable to a more modern power supply whenever you're working on older equipment that requires high current. And also the old car radios and farm radios, the voltage regulation is not that critical anyway. Unlike modern solid state equipment that pretty much has to be spot on, that old tube stuff, it can the voltage can variate over a pretty wide degree there and it not cause any problems. All right, let's go plug this thing in and see if it works. Okay, here we are plugged in with no load attached. All right, let's flip it on. We're set to the six volt scale and let's bring up the output voltage. As you can see, it comes up there pretty quick. Now, if I were to place a load on this, that would bring the output voltage down which we'll demonstrate after a while. You see that's wide open in 15, 16 volts there. We're pegging the meter, but we have no current draw to speak of because we have no load on it. Now when I turn the control all the way to zero, you see it's taking a while to fall back because that capacitor's got a charge on it and the only thing bleeding it off will be that 250 ohm resistor that he installed. Now we'll set it to 12 volts. And the same thing there. So yeah, I think this power supply is working just fine. Okay, just to give you a brief demonstration as far as placing a load on the power supply, I have a 15 ohm 2 watt resistor here. We're set to our 12 volt range. We have our voltage control all the way set to counterclockwise, which is zero output. I'm going to bring this up to get about 12 volts here unloaded on the meter here. Okay, that's about 12 volts. Now I'm going to insert our load into the circuit and you'll see the meter drop a bit. Loaded, loaded, and if we look over at our amp meter, unloaded, loaded, you can see we're drawing a slight bit of current there, and this resistor is getting very warm to the touch, which is totally normal, it's, just, it's supposed to do that. So what was I saying, uh, if we wanted to connect a load to this, such as a car radio or whatever, uh, if it was a 6 volt radio, we'd set our range switch to 6 volts, start out at 0 volts here, turn the power supply, connect the radio up, turn the power supply on, then turn on the radio, and then gradually raise the output voltage control until we read 6 volts on the meter here. Because if we started out with 6 volts unloaded, when you turned on the car radio, the load of the radio would just bring it down very low, so you wouldn't be able to do much good there. So, we have this old 
Zenith 6 volt farm radio and for the heck of it we may just connect it up to this power supply and see what happens and we'll use the not as well filtered output since it has greater current capacity and here's our Zenith radio this has not been restored but is in above average condition and you can see these big honking uh, input leads here and you can tell by the size of them that this radio needs a whopping amount of current in order to operate these types of sets were designed to operate off of a six volt storage battery and then whenever you ran the battery dead you just recharged it well, we're going to connect this to our battery eliminator here yeah I know we're living dangerously and just see if this radio does anything now, as far as these types of radios and the car radios you apply 6 or 12 volts DC whatever is required and the vibrator chops that voltage up into a pulsating voltage which is then fed to a transformer which steps up the voltage and then that voltage is rectified and filtered to provide a high DC voltage for the plate voltage of the tubes and the tube heaters themselves typically run off of the 6 or 12 volt power source okay so the radio is turned on we'll turn the power supply on we're set to 6 volts and we'll gradually bring it up and watch our current meter and make sure nothing bad's happening I can already hear the vibrator So we're at 6 volts and drawing about 3 amps. I tell you what, let's turn it off and connect it to the to the uh, more filtered side and see what happens. Okay, we're connected to the better filtered side that's good for 5 amps continuous. Right, let's turn it on. Start at 0 volts and bring it up. sure that buffer capacitor is probably shot and we don't want to burn up our vibrator it's working and we want to keep it that way now there's one last thing I want to do before we open it up to have a peek at the inside back whenever I was taking electronics at the local community college our instructor was an older guy who had taught there for 33 years and his family came to the United States from Germany whenever he was a kid and by the way they did it the correct way they didn't tunnel under the fence and he taught electronics at the local community college from 1967 until 2000 uh, I had him for my first year and then he retired and then they hired some dipstick that didn't know his butt from a hole in the ground but more about that later but anyway as part of our education uh, part of the day was lecture and then the other part was lab and in the lab we had your typical modern day regulated DC power supplies with voltage and amp meters on them just like this power supply does and for our meters our external meters we had our Simpson 260 analog meters and Keithley digital multimeters and when we were working with the power supply he wanted us to use the external meter not rely on the built-in meter in the power supply well I had this bad habit of always wanting to look at the meter on the power supply and he used to get very upset at me for doing that in fact the last time he got on me about it he told me if I catch you doing that again I'm gonna put a piece of tape over that meter where you're where, 
where you'll have to look at the uh, Simpson meter. I mean, I understand why he was doing it. He was wanting all of us to learn how to read the external meter and to teach us that the external meter is often more accurate than the little meter in the power supply. So with all that said, let's fire this up, set it to six volts, and see if our external meter reading matches the meter reading on the power supply. Alright, power on. Well, if I, turn, if I turn the right knob, something might happen. Alright, that's a little over 5 volts. And what's the meter say? The meter says 6 volts. So, yeah, about a volt difference there. But, you know, that's really no big deal in the grand scheme of things. Okay, here's the inside. We can see what's been done. He's installed some Schottky diodes that are mounted to the old rectifier. And then he soldered some copper tabs to them to add as a heat sink. And then here's the one capacitor he replaced. He left the old one physically in place but disconnected it and attached a new one here. You can see he has it held in place with zip ties and adhesive. And it's not going anywhere. And you can also see how much smaller the new 10,000 microfarad cap is versus the one from 1960 whatever now one of these days I'll probably go back in here and change these other two caps just for just to be on the safe side and then I might you know redo all this to make it more suitable to my liking but it's not something that has to be done right away and you know for right now this is perfectly fine this is not going to these, these are not going to move. They're not going to short out to anything. They're perfectly okay the way they are. But like I said, one day we may tear into this and change out those other two caps and redo this a bit more to my liking. But like I said, for now it's fine. And here's the underside. You can see the honking variable transformer and the big honking filter choke. So... You know, this is pretty simple design. Basically all it is is just a variable transformer that has a variable output secondary and that's feeding a bridge rectifier network which is then filtered by these filter capacitors and this choke here and that's basically all there is to it. Like I said before, no internal voltage regulation. The only voltage regulation is you turning this knob to the proper voltage that's needed for the load being used. Okay, it's all back together and ready to go into service. So when we get ready to tr troubleshoot and restore that Zenith farm radio and some of the old car radios we have around here, then we now have something suitable to do it with. Now, the only thing, there's about a volt discrepancy between this meter and that meter, but like I said, that's no big deal. And if it is a big deal, we can just use the outboard meter to measure the voltage. Because like I've already said, this type of, po type of power supply is not going to be used on anything that's going to get overly pissed off if uh, plus or minus one volt of the rated input is being fed to it so I think we're good to go and I appreciate the seller's honesty in his description and I appreciate him packing it well enough or it wouldn't get destroyed in shipment so you know it's always good to always good to talk about the good sellers whenever they do what they're supposed to and you know, it sort of gives us a breath of fresh air after dealing with all of the ding-a-lings. Alright, that's about all I've got on this, and more to come later. Now, one thing I will say is on items requiring a heavy load, such as the car radios and the farm radio, probably best to use this less filtered, higher current option here, because assuming the radio is working right, after the voltage, the input voltage gets chopped up and stepped up and rectified and filtered 
you know, it's going to be filtered inside of the radio anyway, so that's really that, that's really all that really matters there, and this should do fine for that. Now for stuff requiring better filtering and less current demand, then use this output over here that's more more well filtered and has less current capability. Okay, I misspoke earlier. This originally didn't use selenium rectifiers. It uses magnesium copper sulfide rectifiers, so I uh, thought I'd better clear that up before somebody jumps on me. Alright, and here's the, here's the schematic diagram here. When set to 6 volt operation, these diodes are configured to be a full wave bridge uh, circuit, and then whenever placed in the 12 volt position, we have a voltage doubler configuration here, and then that provides voltage here to our 10,000 microfarad capacitor, which is our first filter capacitor, and then the amp meter is in line with, with that, with that uh, particular line there, as you can see, and then it goes over here to the partially filtered output. However, if we need more filtering, then we have this, we go down here through this filter choke and through another 10,000 microfarad capacitor. And that gives us a more ripple free output for more critical circuits there. Now the only difference between this schematic here and the one shown here that I can see right off the bat is the addition of this 250 ohm 2 watt or excuse me, 220 ohm 2 watt bleeder resistor. So yeah, I thought I'd better show you the schematic of this before we break away so you'll kind of have an idea about what we're working with. Like I said before, this type of power supply is its nothing complicated. We just have a conventional step-down power transformer that's capable of high current. And the secondary is adjustable to give us the uh, correct output voltage based on what our needs are. And then based on the switch position, we go through the rectifier diodes, and then we're filtered by the capacitors and choke here, and, and that's that's all there is to it. It's about as basic as it gets, really as it gets, really. But yeah, I really paid a little more for this than what I wanted to pay. I mean the power supply itself was very reasonable. It was just the shipping that shot it over the top, but when you don't have any antique radio meats or ham radio meats close by and, and nothing like this shows up at the flea markets then and when you have a need for something then you really have no other choice but to pony up and just buy it and that's just the way that is years ago we had an antique radio club that we had yearly swap meats and we had meats in conjunction with the alabama radio club and the ham fest they had over there and i mean finding this kind of stuff 30 years ago 25 30 years ago was not a problem but in today's world it's more of a problem like i said we don't have the meats like we used to have and a lot of the old timers that would have had this stuff have already passed away and the stuff's been disposed of by by whatever means and that's just the way it is as far as eBay goes, I've noticed here lately, even the amount of stuff on eBay is, is not what it used to be. Or let me put it to you this way, the amount of stuff that's of interest to me. I'm seeing a whole lot of modern Chinese garbage, which is no surprise. eBay has pretty much become a dumping ground for that kind of stuff. And... Uh, the amount of vintage stuff that I would want, people are asking these astronomical prices for the stuff, and I just can't justify doing that. With all of the fees and all of the rules and all of the stupid policies that eBay has put in place over the years, they've ran off a good many of the little small-time mom-and-pop sellers who would have uh, sold something like an old radio or record player for a reasonable price just because they wanted to get it out of their way and get it in the hands of somebody who could use it. Those kind of sellers are rapidly disappearing. 
and come next year when they start issuing uh, 1099 K's for proceeds $600 and above versus the former 20 K slash 200 transactions a year limit that it was in most states that's also going to run off a lot of people I mean yeah your people who are already established businesses you know it won't be no big deal for or won't be as big of a deal for them but when you've got your casual hobby sellers and your sellers that are just wanting to get rid of a few excess pieces of whatever at their house to make a little more room and put a few dollars in their pocket, they're probably going to jump ship because they're not going to go through all of, the, uh, all of the red tape and BS that you have to go, to when, uh, go through whenever the RS gets involved. So... So yeah, for those of you who have found things over the years, you know, enjoy what you have and be glad you got it. And for those who are maybe new to this, you know, don't get discouraged. I know it's easy to get that way, but don't get discouraged. There are still deals out there. You may have to look a lot harder for them than you did 20 or 30 years ago, but they're still out there if you look. And even on eBay, sometimes you can find a deal on something, but the key is you have to look and you have to look often because the stuff that's advertised for a reasonable buy it now price, it's not going to stay very long. It's all the stuff that's priced uh, through the moon is what's going to sit up there forever and a day because it's too expensive and these sellers just apparently don't mind sitting on the stuff. And me personally, when... I decide I want to get rid of something, I want it gone. I'm not going to sit on it for months or years. I'll either end up giving it away or throwing it in the garbage. But anyway, that's about all I got on this power supply. One day we'll use it to troubleshoot the Zenith farm radio that you just saw. And we've got some old tube type car radios around here to include the 100% tube type models that use a vibrator power supply and then we have one or two of the newer types that use the uh, 12 volt space charge tubes as well as the uh, solid state audio output stage so yeah I think this power supply will come in handy when working on stuff like that I mean even working on portable transistor radios this power supply will come in handy because like I said, the kind of stuff that I'm going to be working on, it's really not that critical that we have an ultra-regulated power supply. And one other advantage that I forgot to mention of this old-style power supply is no interference produced. A lot of your modern-day power supplies are switch mode types, and a lot of them are not very well filtered, which means if I use such a power supply to troubleshoot an AM radio then there's going to be so much noise generated that it's it's going to be a detriment to the uh, listening process so that's another advantage to this old school type power supply all right enough of that been running my mouth long enough hope you got something out of all of this and I really am done this time <laughs>